Good day, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Alex Sass Show, Common Canadians edition, where we explore immigration to Canada. And we thank Canada Central once again to look behind the scene into the immigration process to Canada. Today we have a special guest, Eduardo Silva, with us. He is a registered immigration consultant, or they call him RCIC, which is Registered Canadian Immigration Consultant. And he's really good at what he does, and that's why we have him here at the show. The reason why this show is so dear to me, again, I got to remind you, brothers and sisters, obviously you can hear in my accent, I'm an immigrant myself. But recently, there's been a lot of changes in the immigration process. As a matter of fact, it's a, such a hot topic that uh, it's been highly politicized uh, by both parties in Canada, by both sides. And... Uh, as a result, there are, has been some changes already to the student visas, and we perceive some changes that are coming as well. We have to adjust constantly, specifically to a political environment. Let's welcome Eduardo. Eduardo, how you doing, my friend? Uh, thank you for having me, and um, my name is Eduardo Silva, and I am an immigration consultant, a regulated immigration consultant in Canada. And also, I'm a mediator and an expert in conflict resolution. I also, I'm also an expert in human rights and forced displacement. Uh, I have studies in, in that area and also law enforcement studies, criminology, and uh, cybersecurity uh, right now. I also worked for the government of Kenya for over four years in strategic planning. And, um, and I have... Uh, experience uh, working in, in different areas of immigration law. I'm also a professor of immigration law for uh, for an institution in Canada. This is what, uh, what I like doing, helping people to come to Canada, helping the right people to come to Canada. Brothers and sisters, it, when I tell you we bring experts onto the show, Eduardo is an expert. If you pay attention to what's going on in Canada specifically, you know, the recent announcement like a few weeks ago uh, with, uh, I don't even know exactly what happened with the student visa applications and how does it impact uh, specifically Canada Central and immigration process to Canada. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, totally. Um, actually, there are a lot of changes that have been happening uh, lately, and I think it, it worries a lot of uh, projects uh, for new uh, newcomers, especially for international students, um, the 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 government of Kenya have chosen to reduce the number of uh, of study permits to accept the number of study permits. Uh, they set up a cap of three hundred and sixty thousand um, applications being uh, for this year. So basically, they're going, they're they're going to accept only three hundred and sixty thousand. Uh, applications in comparison to the 500 and something thousand that they accepted uh, last year. So by saying that, uh, we've seen a decrease of uh, uh, of approvals of over uh, over 40 percent. Um, so that, uh, that also that worries the international students. And uh, beside the cap, there is um. Uh, there's other there are other rules that are affecting the process itself. Uh, for example, they have asked uh, the provinces to provide uh, an attestation letter, which is a uh, provincial attestation letter. is called PAL, and um, and basically they what they do is that the student needs to get an approval from the province. That mm -hmm. verifies the acceptance letter of the uh, of, of the institution. Why? Because uh, it happened. There were there were a lot of fraud or frauds committed by agent international agencies and also by some students that they were uh, they were using fraudulent letter of acceptance from institutions. And when they arrived to Canada, they were actually not accepted at the, at the institution, mm -hmm. and uh, and and it affected like up around 
10,000 students wow. uh, uh, last year. So they decided to 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 generate a rule where where uh, the student needs an approval from the province first to verify that letter of acceptance. That is going to make the process a little bit longer. So that's the second part. part. And also there's uh, some changes on post-graduation work permits. That's a concern to the it's a concern to the uh, current uh, like students as well. It's not just to the newcomers. Do they change the process for everybody? Uh, actually, well, just for me to understand, or is it uh, the students that already were sort of grandfathered in that already been in the country under the process? Do they does that affect them as well, or is it for the all newcomers? Yeah, not really. It's not going to affect uh, students that have already applied under other rules. Because what happens is obviously they move to Canada uh, believing in certain rules and, uh, and uh, the government is not going to actually say, well, we're going to change the rules and you're going to, uh, you're going to need to accommodate yourself to those rules if, when you're in Canada already. However, they, they enter uh, due dates or starting dates for, cer for cer certain rules and also for uh, for they are more for new applicants, mm -hmm. right? So applicants that are applying after January first, twenty twenty four. That's where that that they need to comply with those new rules. Uh, the applicants that were already in Canada or they have applied before January first, twenty twenty four, they don't need to uh, they don't need to comply with the the the. Uh, the recent rules, they they will bind themselves with the previous rules. Okay, you were so, saying uh, it's, that does affect the post graduation people though with the new rules. What what is that? Well, it could be a positive um, positive change. For example, there were people that were in, in, enrolled in master programs. And those master programs were only for a year or a year and a half duration. And they were only allowed to get a postgraduate work permit for that period of time. So the government asked, um, or they made a change, uh, giving the opportunity for people that are, uh, that are in programs, graduate programs like master's degree or, or PhDs, to no matter the duration of the program, to apply for a postgraduate work permit that is a three-year duration postgraduate postgraduate work permit. So, by saying that, uh, that will benefit a lot of students that are uh, they 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 are enrolling master's degrees. Mm -hmm. So they have a window, a bigger window to to get a uh, work experience to apply for a Canadian experience class. Um, uh, 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 application or permanent resident, permanent residents through the Canadian Experience class. That's good. Um, yeah, that um, that that starts from actually starts from February 15, twenty twenty four. That new rule, and um, but the the other side of the postgraduate work permit rules is that the limited. The uh, they limited some institutions to to provide in their programs a postgraduate work permit. So they, especially private institutions that have some agreements with public institutions, they they were offering the postgraduate work permit after graduation of their program. But they realized that there are a lot of a lot of uh, institutions were not providing good services to students. They were not realistic with the the living uh, situations of uh, international students in Canada. They um, let's say they the students were misinformed, and that uh, created an impact in a lot of students. So the government was very strict about that, and they said, "Well, you know what." No more private institutions and cert that offer certain programs are going to be allowed to offer the postgraduate work permit after the program. So that's going to affect the economy of a lot of institutions. 
and it's going to reduce the number of people applying to those institutions, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, another change that I think uh, is very important to, to highlight is the open work permit for spouses. Mm -hmm. I think this is um, really affecting uh, the movement of newcomers that have family members and they're willing to apply. So it's like a, it's a reunification of the family. So is it something different? It is different. Uh, what happens is that when you are an international student and you have family and you have a spouse or children, you were allowed with the family, like your family members were allowed to apply uh, uh, the children for study permits uh, if they were five years or older. And the, the spouses or common law partners they were allowed to apply for an open work permit. So when they moved to Canada, the partner was able to find jobs in Canada and help the, the principal applicant support themselves. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, now, like the new role is that no more open work permits for the spouses. Children can apply for study permits, yeah, but no open work permit for spouses unless the student is enrolled in a master's or a doctorate program or a PhD. Mm -hmm. So obviously the number of applications now are going to be reduced because families don't want to move to Canada together if the spouse is not uh, accepted or is not going to get a, 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 an open work permit. Um, then that's strictly that's strictly for the students. Yeah, of course, uh, in for international students. So we're hoping that this rule can change a little bit and um, probably be a little bit more flexible with uh, programs like postgraduate programs, or uh, uh, at least, and that uh, spouses can can apply for for an open work permit. Now, uh, Eduardo, uh, important to know uh, because, you know, we come here to this country for better life, for better life, not only for ourselves, but for our families, for opportunity, etc. So one of the opportunities when we come here as students or on the work permit, etc., is eventually to bring the family. Uh, I understand there's some ways, uh, some changes, or maybe not, maybe there is a particular way for reunification of the family. Uh, and what can you tell us about that? Yeah, Canada is making a big effort to uh, to support families, and they understand the importance of having your loved ones uh, close to you in order to to improve or to have more motivation and to develop uh, yourself. Uh, uh, in different areas in the country and to feel more com comfortable in the country. Just imagine if you you were spending a really long weekend, long uh, winter time in Regina or, or Saskatoon uh, by yourself and you have your love, loved ones in your home country and, and, uh, and that you cannot bring them with you, especially your children or your spouses, right? Or, or, yeah. or partners. So it will affect, it will affect you uh, mentally and also it will affect your, your, your goals. So obviously they, they think it is important to keep people mentally safe as well. And also to, uh, to have motivation to keep working to, uh, and to increase the economy of the country. Um, so the, the, the new rules now, or the, um, there are some changes or they announce new measures, for example, for family reunification is that, uh, they will fast the reunification applications or temporary resident visas for spousal applicants. For example, people that have work permits in Canada, they are working in Canada and they want to bring their spouse. Uh, they can apply for their spouse to come to Canada uh, with a with an open work permit, or or they can apply for a for a visa, just a, a tourist 
for visitor visa so they can uh, they can fast that process right so yeah. they will focus their attention on, on fasting that process um they have new and dedicated processing tools for uh spousal trb applicants which is our uh which is temporary resident visa applicants so they have uh, better tools to process those applications and there are open work permits they're offering open work permits for spousal and family class applicants uh as i mentioned for international students was a really good thing a lot of people benefit from from that for over two or three years where uh their their partners could apply for the open work permit this is no longer uh, uh the uh, benefit but there's still some international students that can uh, get their spouses or partners to apply for an open work permit um also there's like open work permit extensions for um, for uh, spouses and partners and um uh and in, in overall i think is uh they are increasing or they are benefit uh, they are creating more benefits to people that are newcomers in Kenya and they want to bring their uh, loved ones to to Kenya as well there is also uh the 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 benefit of having your children applying for school uh, or for a study permit where they can go to go to school while you are doing work either working or studying in Kenya and they can uh register into a public school with no cost that's right? on, under so, the under the re reunification policy yeah the reunification policy which applies for our uh, applicants that are in Kenya with uh, with a study permit or with a work permit or for or applicants or people that have um, a temporary work permit, for example, not for visitors. Uh, if you if you want if you are visiting Kenya or if you are a tourist in Kenya, you are not going to be allowed to bring your children and have them uh, apply for a study permit and study in Kenya while, while you are uh, visiting Kenya, right? So. Not in those cases, but in other cases, uh, they will have that opportunity. There's so much information you just shared. My head is actually spinning. Like I can't really, I, mean, I understand it better now that I talked to you, but still I understand we just touched the tip of the iceberg. And in terms of the procedural aspect of that, that's probably a whole another hour we can spend just covering the overview of those things. So I encourage you brothers and sisters, uh, remove that headache, uh, focus on what you do best and leave it to professionals. You know, like the way you watch our show, uh, I'll encourage you to contact Canada Central and Eduardo Silver and they guide you through the process uh, the best way possible so you can focus on your things, you can focus on your studies, you can focus on your work, you can focus on your family. And uh, I, Eduardo, once again, I want to thank you so much for joining us here today and uh, spending your time, your precious time, because I understand you are a really busy man and uh, family man, and family is important to you, and what you're doing is a good God's work as well. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. And we hope to see you soon again. I mean, this is like, we can't cover all the information in just one show, so uh, hopefully you'll be our regular guest for this. If you are willing to move to Canada, or if, if it's a life goal, uh life plans matter and they need to uh be addressed properly and you have to be advised uh, uh from professionals in the area uh, there is a lot of scams there are there are a lot of scams out there people that are wasting a lot of money and they are um uh they their goals and life plans have been affected and uh, just because they didn't get the proper advice from professionals in the area uh we update ourselves constantly we are regulated by um by the by the CICC 
and uh, who, who protects also our clients. And um, and uh, we, we need to think that this is very important and that you need to have a good understanding of, of the process and trusted advice. So, um, so yeah, that's the idea. That's why we are here. That's why we became professionals in the area to help people and to help new carpenters in Canada. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Thank you for sharing your time. Thank you for sharing your expertise. And uh, we'll see a lot more of you. Brothers and sisters, thank you so much for tuning in to Alex's show, Common Canadians Edition. And we'll see you on the next one. 